And so I'm only presenting this or uh, going and drawing attention to this because I think it's important and I think there needs to be larger awareness of what is happening in this in these specific interviews um what it what is actually being promoted and, and peddled and the way that liberal secular thought can distort and manipulate the muslim mind and get the muslim to speak or even think in ways that are contrary to islam and going against islamic values going against the Quran, going against the Sunnah. And so this is a subtle influence. This is a subtle influence of liberal secular thought. Liberal secular thought, you don't have to go to the university to be affected by it. You don't have to go and study it or you don't have to take a philosophy class to be affected by it. It's something that is in the air. It's in the water. We all are affected by it in the way that we speak and think. And if we're not careful, uh, then that can lead to contradictions. It can lead us to saying things that are incorrect, improper. It can trap us. It can trap us into ways of thinking that uh, for some, it can lead them out of Islam. And so this is a subtle influence where even the most you know, well-respected or learned or scholarly individuals uh, can be affected they can be affected in the way that they speak and they teach. And if you don't recognize that influence and you don't recognize the traps, you don't recognize the kind of patterns in this way of thought, then you are liable to fall, uh, fall prey to it. So this is what I would like to go through, inshallah, in depth, in detail uh, in this episode of Muslim Skeptic Live. I hope you can join me uh, for most of it and take notes if you want and pay attention really to um, some of these ideas that I'm going to try to inshallah convey to you in the best way possible so that in the future inshallah you can recognize when you hear an interview or if you're interviewed if you, if you have to speak on something or you're put on the spot uh, you want to be able to speak properly and not fall into these traps. And so on the theme of hate, on the theme of hate speech, uh, I want to start by reciting an ayah of the Quran. And I'll read the translation. So let's read the translation of this. This is the 64th verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah. And Allah says, And the Jews say, The hand of Allah is chained. Chained are their hands, and cursed are they for what they say. Rather, both his hands are extended. He spends however he wills, and that which has been revealed to you from your Lord will surely increase many of them in transgression and disbelief. And we have cast among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. Every time they kindled the fire of war against you, Allah extinguished it. And they strive throughout the land, causing corruption, and Allah does not like corruptors. And in another ayah, I'll read you the translation. Allah says, And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say, The Messiah is the son of Allah. That is the saying from their mouths. They imitate the sayings of the disbelievers of old, and Allah's curse be upon them how they are deluded away from the truth. So this is these two ayat that I read, these two verses. My question for everyone who may be listening to this or watching this at a later date, are is this hate speech? Are these ayat hate speech? This is very relevant. This is very relevant. Why? Because the Muslim preachers, the imams and the scholars who have been put on this hate list, on this preacher hate preacher list, part of the reason, part of the justification for them being put on that list is reciting these verses 
reciting from the Quran. So what does that mean? What's the implication of that? I just recited these verses. I recited from the book of Allah. As a Muslim, I know that this is the book coming from the creator of all the universe. The creator of all that exists has sent these verses, has elucidated the nature of reality through these verses and the entire Quran and through the sayings and the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if this is hate speech, if speaking and reciting the book of Allah is not allowed because it is hateful within Denmark and other parts of Europe, then this is preventing Muslims from their own religion. It's preventing Muslims from teaching their own religion, from reciting their book, from uh, teaching and speaking about and giving durus on the book of Allah. So what is the implications of that? And what is the, what does that mean for secularism? What does that mean for liberal secularism? Right? So we're going to get into a lot more depth on this topic. And we're going to analyze, you know, this kind of tension or conflict uh, in the secular understanding of what is or isn't hate speech. Uh, the sad part is that I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the United States, some masajid, a minority of masajid, will not even recite these verses. They won't even recite these ayat, other than maybe in Tarawih, in you know in Ramadan, they'll they'll recite when they're when they're reciting every juz. But uh, outside of that, they won't even recite these ayat. Anything that is referring to uh, other religious groups in this negative way um, for their beliefs and their actions, okay. Anything that's related to that, they're not going to recite it. They're not going to reference it. They're going to pretend like it doesn't exist. Why? I don't know. Why? I don't know. Because in, in the United States, it, it's different than in Europe. Um, some of the hate speech laws are um, not as uh, strict as they are in certain parts of Europe. And there's not necessarily as much sensitivity on certain things. Nonetheless, I mean, this is changing. This is changing. The, uh, the environment is changing. The political context is changing where, you know, even things like reciting these ayat from the Quran or teaching certain hadith is being viewed as unacceptable, not allowed. You can't teach certain parts of your religion. So these masajid are self, the law hasn't changed yet, but these masajid are self-censoring. These certain imams, the, you know, the ones, especially the ones that are most engaged in interfaith, quote unquote, dialogue, um, they're self-censoring themselves big time. They're not going to recite these ayat. But what is the implication of that? If you're not, you're deliberately avoiding, you're de de deliberately hiding certain parts of the book, you're deliberately avoiding touching on certain ayat of the Book of Allah. And we all know the problem with that. We all know the problem. Allah, in fact, criticizes. I mean, this is the circle here. Allah criticizes Bani Israel uh, and, and past Jewish and Christian communities for doing this, for hiding parts of Scripture and writing Scripture with their own hands and saying this is from Allah. They hide and they concoct. They hide and they concoct. And this is what the, the past communities in the Quran, Allah is criticizing them and saying, you're doing this, you're distorting. Why is Allah telling us this in the Quran? Why is Allah relaying this history? Why is Allah pointing to certain kinds of practices and certain kinds of beliefs in the Quran for us? It's so that we don't fall into the same mistakes. 
we don't follow fall into that same trap. We don't follow that path. And so how ironic, how ironic or inevitable that these certain groups, these certain imams, these certain masajid are not teaching these things because of political correctness or because of they want to avoid backlash for some reason, uh, may, oftentimes there's paranoia, or they want to you know, solidify that you know, cozy relationship they have with different churches or synagogues or what have you, or government officials. And so they're not teaching this essential, essential knowledge, this essential information from the Book of Allah. And so when the Prophet وسلم, says that we will follow Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, hand span by hand span, even unto a lizard hole. Well, this is something that makes it an inevitable when we don't even we're not even educated. When when parts of the community are not even educated on the mistakes of the of these prior communities, these prior uh, believers in God of these different communities who made these mistakes that led them to kufr, led them to disobedience of Allah. We're not in certain parts of the community learning about that. Uh, Brother Ifat uh, is saying that we are conditioned to think like this. We are conditioned to think in this kind of um, way that we feel like censoring our own teachings. Uh, Abu Mujaddid uh, makes a great point. Or they won't relate these ayat to be applicable to contemporary times. The Quran, of course, the Quran is uh, applicable, relevant to contemporary times. Of course, Allah is, this is the message that Allah is sending us so that we're aware of wrong ideas, okay? Wrong ideas, wrong beliefs, and wrong actions. Um, so that we won't make those same mistakes. They're very relevant. And so I agree, like, there is this, they'll refer, you have certain people, certain preachers who will refer to the ayat, they'll read the ayat in a way, in the sense of, oh, well, these are just from the past. These are stories of old, right? That kind of mentality. And so they're not relevant. Um, so yeah, that's a big uh, problem as well. Um, so let's look at the interview. We're going to start with um, a short intro from the interview, from the interview. So again, this is a Danish radio program that has interviewed uh, Mufti Mink and uh, Sheikh Muhammad Sharif. And this is what, uh, this is like the two minute introduction to the longer interviews. Take a look. Hello, this is a message from Muhammad Sharif to the Honorable Inger Stoiberg. Sister Inger Stoiberg, I greet you with the greeting of peace, love, goodness, kindness, serenity, calmness, tranquility, respect, and tolerance. I'm one of the people that was put on the ban from Denmark list. I'm a Canadian citizen, English is my first language, and all the Western values that you believe in, I believe in too. I was shocked to find out just from a journalist that I've been placed on the hate preachers list I take full responsibility for what I said in the past, that was 20 years ago, but I still take responsibility for it and I apologize. If you were to look at what I've done in the last 3-4 years, whether it be on social media or elsewhere, you will find that I've worked tirelessly promoting harmony, coexistence, respect of differences, and understanding that each one has his own freedom. I have corrected myself where I've made a mistake, and I'm still open for correction if people were to correct me. But I would like to speak to you directly. I want you to give me a chance to reform, because I really don't want to be on a hate preacher list in the country of Denmark. I believe you, you can do better than that. I'm sure you would be able to look deeply and you would be able to distinguish right from wrong. I invite you to do that. And I invite you to build not only your nation, but to build the globe to becoming a more peaceful place. Thank you very much, my sister, and have a lovely day. Mm. Okay, so that is the introduction uh, to the interviews. 
And so already you can see hopefully some issues, uh, some issues that um, are with that, just those brief statements, like saying that my values are Western values, that kind of very uh, unqualified statement is a problem right off the bat. That's a big problem. Uh, there are many values. There are, there are some values that are shared between Islam and the West. I mean, there are certain things that the Western world, Western modernity has gotten right. I mean, no use denying it. There are certain things that they've gotten right and many, many other things that they've gotten wrong, very wrong. And so we should not give a unqualified statement like our values are Western values. An example of a Western value that uh, we do share uh, that is found in Islam, for example, is the importance of due process, the importance of due process uh, for criminal, for people who are accused of crimes, um, going through a process of determining someone's guilt through evidence and deliberation and investigation and so forth. This is due process. This is something that uh, is definitely valued within Islam. But uh, unfortunately, that even that value within the West is being um, eroded because of things like uh, the feminist drive to um, uh, basically banish things like victim blaming, quote unquote, if someone accuses someone else of uh, sexual assault or harassment, then we should believe all victims and things like this. This is actually eroding due process, values like due process. Um, so that's a separate topic. Um, another Western value, equality before the law. Uh, this should be a value at least. I, I'm, I don't know how well it's being implemented in the Western world today. But in general, equality before the law means that it doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. If you break the law, then you're going to be held accountable equally. No, no matter your socioeconomic status. I mean, this is an ideal also, very explicit within Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu mentions this, that uh, when it comes, for example, to the application of hudud, the had, uh, of stealing, for example, it doesn't matter if someone rich steals something or something someone poor steals something. Um, it doesn't matter if they're rich or poor or their what tribe they belong to, their family, uh, how high of a social status they have. There's going to be consequences equally uh, in front of the law. So again, this is something that is supposed to be a Western value. Unfortunately, it's eroded in our times because of uh, the way that the legal system in America, at least, I'm sure it's the same in many Western countries, where the rich can buy their way out uh, facing legal consequences. The law is uh, less strict. Judges are less strict. They're more lenient when it comes to sentencing rich, the rich of society when they commit crimes as opposed to the poor. Um, you have you know, so many examples uh, with the financial meltdown of 2008. Um, bankers who were involved essentially in stealing so much money people's money billions of dollars were lost uh, people's money was lost because of the irresponsible deliberately negligent self-serving actions of uh, wall street and these bankers and so those individuals uh, involved in that scheme colluding with each other colluding with government officials faced no consequences even though they brought the economic world to the brink of collapse and affected uh, millions of lives and create and basically put millions of people into poverty because of their actions, but they faced no consequences. They didn't even receive a slap on the wrist within the legal system. But if you're poor and you, you know, for example, get uh, caught stealing a bag of Cheetos from a uh, grocery store, you can face severe consequences. You can even be Put in prison for something like that whereas the rich uh, these wall street bankers destroying so many lives nothing comparable to what the petty um, you know shoplifter is doing face no consequence at all so this is a corruption this is corruption within uh, western society within western laws 
But nonetheless, you can say that the value is shared between the West and Islam. But those are just a couple of examples. So many other areas, there's conflict between Islamic values and Western values. And so that's going to come uh, to light within uh, these interviews. So let's start with... Actually, you are not only banned from entering Denmark, you are actually not allowed to enter any of the Schengen country. It's 26 countries. Um, what are your concerns about that? All right, actually, let's start with Mohammed Sharif uh, first. Start with him and then go, because it's shorter, and then go to Mufti Menk. How do I feel about that? I think that's um, incredibly uh, um, unjust. That, so it's unjust for two reasons. Number one is that I was not given due process. So in other words, how we have in our Western values is that if you're going to bring a claim about somebody, you have to say it to them. And you have to give them a chance to respond. And part of our Western values, and I'm sure these are Denmark values as well, is you have to give the opportunity for somebody to reform. But the- okay, so the problem here is uh, Muhammad al-Sharif is appealing to due process. Um, but I don't know if that's the right response to have to this whole entire situation. Because again, what happened was you have uh, the Danish foreign minister, minister of immigration. Her name is Inga Stoiberg. Inga Stoiberg. And she is, in fact, a far right, um, almost fascistic uh, politician within Denmark. And she has had a long history of anti-Muslim animus. Uh, So she is no friend of Muslims. She is no friend. uh, She doesn't want Muslims in the country. And there are many examples of, of her speaking to this. For example, there, one example of Inga Stoiberg uh, is her saying that within Ramadan, that Muslims who are fasting should not work. They should just leave work and not work because they're bringing down the product, productivity of companies and this is harming the nation, this is harming Denmark when Muslims fast. And so Muslims either they should not fast or they should just not work. So this is one example uh, of her kind of Muslim and Islam hatred. And then another example is uh, it came out that she uh, was promoting the cartoons of the Prophet ﷺ, the Danish cartoons, um, where they were mocking the Prophet ﷺ and drawing cartoons of him as this or that. So these kinds of extremely hateful, offensive cartoons She was defending them. She was saying that this is actually nothing wrong with it. We need to have uh, these cartoons. In fact, we need to display these cartoons in museums. We need to put these cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad in museums so that people can see it as a monument, as a testament to religious freedom and free thought and free speech and all of these important Western values. We need to be promoting them front and center. And there is even a slight controversy because uh, reporters, journalists uh, found out that she even has a uh, her back background for her phone. Either her, f- her phone or her iPad has a picture. <laughs> that cartoon of the Prophet Sallallahu is the background of her iPad of her iPad that she uses on a daily basis. And when they asked her about that, she also said that, yeah, I'm not ashamed that I have this cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad uh, because this reminds me every day about the values that we enjoy within Denmark and within the West more generally. So this is who, this is the person who is banning uh, Mufti Menk and Muhammad al-Sharif. This is Inga Stoiberg, which you heard in the introduction. They were calling her my sister and this and that. Be speaking uh, like that about her and and praising her and basically, uh, you know, saying these kinds of things to her. So, but let's let's take a step back. So this country has banned you and has called you a hateful person, a hate preacher. Instead of invoking 
uh, due process and oh there should be some kind of trial <laughs> I should be on, I should be put on trial like I don't even know how that makes sense but you should just say that look who cares right if you're asked if this Danish news is contacting you this reporter and saying I want to interview and get your thoughts about how you feel being banned from Denmark they should perhaps perhaps you know in my opinion maybe they should have said there's no need to give an interview. I really don't care. I didn't know about this ban. I didn't know I was banned. And frankly, I don't care. I, ne- I had no plans to visit Denmark. What's so special about Denmark? Why would I want to go to Denmark? I think that would be, in my opinion, you know, from where I'm sitting, I think that would be a better uh, kind of response. You know, who cares? I don't know the first thing about your country. Right. So this is when you when you start talking about this is unjust and there needs to be due process, it makes it sound like you really want to be going to that country. You really want a place uh, you want them to let let you in. So it's what's the impression like I don't want to insult anyone, but what's the impression when you show this kind of eagerness? To a country that has, or a country's government that has rejected you. Um, and also on, on the grounds, like, if a country, okay, let's say Denmark, says that if you teach these verses of the Quran, if you teach these specific Quran, or you teach these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu then we consider you a hate preacher and you can't come to our country. Okay, they're wrong, of course. This is wrong, but why is it wrong? Is it wrong? You can't say that it's wrong because all countries should be open and borders should be open and whoever wants to come go to whatever country should be allowed and etc etc that's not a good explanation that's not a good reason why because think about muslim countries should muslim countries uh, ban someone like richard dawkins the atheist richard dawkins should countries ban muslim countries ban um let's say the pope you know, that's an article that I wrote recently on MuslimSkeptic.com on how the UAE is inviting the Pope to come and preach and give mass to 100,000 people. Okay, Shouldn't a Muslim country say, no, we don't allow? The Muslim government say, no, the Pope is not allowed to come here and preach? Or any number of individuals that a Muslim country... We'll say, no, you're banned. You're banned from traveling to our country because what you are saying is contrary to Islam. It's contrary to the Sharia. It's something that is going to cause uh, problems. Uh, it's going to threaten the uh, Iman of people. So Muslim countries should should be having that kind, those kinds of bans. So the problem here is not with the banning because okay. again, Muslims have an interest, and according to the Sharia, there is an interest in preventing certain figures from being able to come to Darul Dar- Islam, to Muslim countries. So the problem is not with limiting that or banning travel in that sense. The problem is limiting travel for what reason? What is the reason that they're banning Muslims and Imams and scholars from traveling to their countries. The reason that the Danish uh, foreign minister has is based on batil, is based on falsehood, is based on their secular uh, musings on what constitutes hate, their secular musings on what constitutes truth. Okay, These, these kinds of ideas that are self-contradictory, irrational, contradictory to Islam, the truth, 
That's what the foreign minister, Inga Stoiberg, has in her mind. That's why it's wrong. That's why these bans are wrong. That's why preventing Muslims from going to Denmark or Mufti Mink or Muhammad al-Sharif or anyone else, that's why it's wrong, because of those ideas. Not because of, oh, all borders should be open and people should all be able to travel freely and go wherever they want. No, because as Muslims, we don't want that. For our countries, our reasoning for banning people is based on truth, is based on the words of Allah, is based on the words of the Prophet wasallam is based on the Sharia, is based on our sacred divine law. That's the difference. But if you've internalized secularism, you've internalized the liberal, liberal secular uh, metric, then this is going to be a contradiction for you. You're going to have a hard time understanding why. You'll, you'll have to resort to this idea of, well, you know, all borders should be open and it's always wrong for any country to ban someone because if it's wrong for uh, non-Muslim countries to ban Muslims then what else can you say than it's wrong for Muslim countries to ban non-Muslims this is internalized secularism why because it, it makes Islam equal to not Islam it makes Islam Islamic standards Islamic values equal to anything else. All other religions, all other values, all other beliefs. That is the secular assumption. That is the secular mindset. That all beliefs, all religious beliefs, all religious beliefs are equal. They're equally false. They're all equally false. Therefore, it's illegitimate to ban someone from entering your country on the basis of their particular religious beliefs, but then have a problem with another country banning you because of your religious beliefs. This is the influence of a secularized mindset. It's extremely subtle. It's extremely subtle. And we talked about when it comes to the Pope and how I was saying, and many were saying that, the Pope shouldn't be allowed to come to the to the Muslim world and give mass and do Catholic dawah. But does that mean that we also don't think Muslims shouldn't have masajid and Muslims shouldn't give talks and Muslims shouldn't do dawah in the non-Muslim world, in the Christian world, in, in the West? No, that doesn't follow. So this is... This is the problem right off the bat with appealing to due process... Uh, let's continue. The ministry uh, sent me the documentation which justifies putting you on the list. And I would like to go through some of the documentation with you. The first is an audio speech um, from you from the 10th of July, 2013. And it's called Why the Jews Were Cursed. Here you say that it was the Jews who woke Allah's anger because they didn't appreciate his blessings and they didn't accept his rules. And in the end, you say that uh, the Jews can never be your allies and that you can never marry a Jew. I would like to ask you, um, where this uh, hostility against Wait, Jews come from? Sorry? Did I, it says I, I said that you can't marry a Jew. It says that, that in, the, the in the preach, yes, from uh, the 10th of July, 2013, if they are still uh, believing. So this is a speech from 2000. I recognize the huge mistake that I made in this speech, even from that time. And I deleted that speech. And I, you know, so um, it was given in a closed circle in the United States in the year 2000, so we're talking about about 18 years ago, right now. I deleted it, and the only propagation of that speech that happened afterwards was from Islamic phobic websites. So they picked it up, and then they started sharing around. So I've never actually said that. These aren't my words. That, I'm sorry, it isn't my intention to spread any of these messages. I made my mistake, and any person who asks me about this, I will unequivocally, with no excuses, tell you that I made a mistake in those wordings. That last part that you mentioned about, oh, you can't marry a Jew and stuff like that, I don't, I don't think that that's my wording, and that's why I want to double-check with you the source. But the, um, the basis of what you're saying is correct. 
I did make a speech like that um, 18 years ago, and um, I've apologized for it. I continue to apologize. I count it as one of the biggest mistakes in my speaking history, in fact. All right, so you don't uh, feel any hostility against Jews today? Um, no, uh, actually, on top of that, I don't feel any hostility to any human being. Uh, Jews, Christians, atheists, Hindus, any human being that we're all in this together and it's all about the values of human beings has nothing to do with a person's religion. Okay, so this... Uh talk that he's referring to um, the khutbah it was a khutbah I believe from the year 2000 so I um, went back and I listened to what I believe that they're referring to and the thing is that I listened to it and all he's doing within that khutbah uh, is going through the ayat that refer to Ahlul Kitab he's going through the ayat one by one um, and discussing, you know, giving a very basic tafsir of these ayat that refer to Ahlul Kitab. So it's, it wasn't really sp specific to Yahud, to Jews. It was, he was mentioning Christians and Jews because certain verses mention both Christians and Jews. Some of them only refer to Yahud, which is like the one that I started the broadcast with and reciting. And then others are referring to um, both Christians and Jews. And so this is something that his, his khutbah was purely concerned with that. Um, I listened to most of it, and I didn't really see anything that beyond that, beyond just going through the ayat, relaying lessons, what is Allah trying to convey by giving us examples of past communities, by giving us examples of how uh, Jews and Christians behaved and acted and what they believed in so that most, the Muslim community can learn from mistakes, can learn from those kinds of problems that they brought upon themselves. So is that hate speech? And that's the question that I began the, um, the live broadcast with. Is that hate speech to just teach uh, the Quran? Many, of, many ayat, it's not like one or two ayat in the Quran that are talking about Jews and Christians. Many of them are talking about Jews and Christians. My, what I think is uh, a problem or is hypocritical is how you have Inga Stoiberg, this foreign minister of Denmark, who is promoting uh, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is talking about uh, speaking against Ramadan and how Ramadan is something that is backwards, is taking the country backwards in productivity. Uh, and many others uh, within Denmark, they have a long tradition of secularists and atheists attacking Islam. Uh, you had that same uh, person who was drawing cartoons of the Prophet also you know, taking verses of the Quran and writing them on naked women, uh, writing those verses on naked women as an act of sacrilege. And they consider this art and this is free expression and freedom of speech. So you have a secular culture, the Danish culture, that is advocating this, can this animosity towards religion and specifically Islam. But then you want to make a big deal uh, about the... Muslims just teaching the verses of the Quran, teaching about certain beliefs as being noxious, certain beliefs and certain practices and certain behaviors of communities uh, in the past and sometimes in the present that are dangerous and noxious and harmful and destructive and take the human heart and destroy the human heart because of kufr and, and things of this nature. So we can't teach our religion we can't spread our religion and these ideas but you can spread your insults and your attacks and your critiques of islam and other religions as as much as you want so this is a very clear double standard it's a double standard based on your own standards not our standards because our standard is not freedom of speech our standard is not freedom of speech 
and I'll explain um, what I mean by that in a second. The other thing that um, he said was that I love people. Uh, Muhammad al-Sharif said, I love people no matter what, no matter if they're Jew, Christian, Muslim, atheist, whatever, Buddhist, whatever. So, I mean, this is kind of a broad statement that I'm sure like he could give an explanation for what that means. Um, but do we love people? regardless of what they believe in you have some people who believe that uh, all Muslims should be killed should we love them for that belief in spite of that belief you have you know a example relevant to modern political discourse you have some uh, people who believe that whites are the superior race that's their belief and they have even created a kind of religion a kind of religiosity with this idea that whites are the superior race uh should we should we love people like that should we respect people like that so there are certain beliefs that even within this liberal secular society are understood to be harmful, are understood to be dangerous, are understood to be uh, toxic. These white supremacists, they will say that we're not advocating violence, we're not advocating any kind of harm to others. All we're saying is that whites are the superior race. Whites are the superior race and whites need to be to have their own nation, basically. That's what the white nativists are preaching, and they are very careful to denounce violence. They just have a belief. But if you ask the average uh, liberal, philosophically liberal person in the political mainstream, what do you think about those beliefs? They'll admit that these are terrible beliefs. And whoever's advocating those kinds of beliefs are doing something terrible. This is wrong. And if you ask them, oh, well, shouldn't you love everyone? Shouldn't you love people regardless of their beliefs? They'll say, are you crazy? I'm not going to love a white supremacist. I'm not going, if you tell, if someone says that this is their belief, they believe that whites are superior. I'm not going to affirm that I love them. That's the furthest thing of concern right now is whether I love them or not. Let's focus on the white supremacy and the harm that's caused by that and the, the noxiousness, the toxicity of that belief. So then why, so you have this understanding of uh, racial superiority being uh, wrong, being immoral. As Muslims, we agree, of course, we agree that uh, this white supremacist attitude is wrong. But there are other beliefs that are even more wrong, more immoral, more noxious. Believing that Allah has a son. Believing that there are partners with Allah. Believing that all of this creation, everything around us and within us, is just the product of chance without a creator. Those are extremely harmful beliefs. Those are extremely dangerous beliefs. Even more so, even more so than racial superiority. So this is, this is something that Muslims, <laughs> the sirens, they're, they're coming for me. They're coming for me right now. Uh, <laughs> so this is something that we have to recognize uh, is that there are beliefs that are dangerous. And when it is said that there's religious freedom in the West, there's religious freedom in the West, meaning that there are certain, that no matter what you believe, you can practice what you believe. You can practice what you believe, you can teach what you can believe because this, this is religious freedom. Well, this is not the case. It's only because you've defined religion in a very specific way. You've defined religion in a very narrow way. Only certain beliefs fall within the parameters of being a religion. And even within that narrow band 
There are certain religious beliefs that you don't allow, that are not uh, kosher, so to speak, that are not, you're not allowed to teach them. So this is how religious freedom, quote unquote, is, is such a manipulated concept. It's such a manipulated concept. Let me give you an example. Yeah, so like I mentioned, white supremacy, racial supremacy. If that is part of your uh, religion, then it's not. you're not allowed to preach that. That's considered hateful. And it's interesting because you do have, we do have a very uh, well-known religion that does have a concept of racial superiority uh, within Judaism. Jews are the chosen people. That kind of superiority can be taught and can, is acceptable within the religiously free West. Um, but other types of racial superiority are, are not. Are not um, if, you, even if you claim that this is my religious belief, that whites are superior to other races, no, you can be sanctioned by the government, you can face all kinds of legal consequences, you can face all kinds of social consequences, you can be fired from your job, economically you can suffer because of that belief. It's a belief, right? If you believe in racial superiority, that can be is just as much a belief as believing that uh, Allah is the creator. Believing that, you know, Jesus... Ayasam, Isa, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God and the Messiah. Those are all beliefs. You have all of these different beliefs. Believing that, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, same-sex marriage is something moral. That's a belief. Believing that a woman has the right to choose what happens to her body, and has the right to decide to terminate a pregnancy. That's a belief. Believing that... Uh, guns should not be in the hands of private citizens. We need gun control. That's a belief. Believing that the United States should be involved with spreading democracy throughout the world. That's a belief. These are all beliefs. What makes certain beliefs quote unquote religious and others not? And how can you justify that on a secular basis from a secular standpoint? This is something that secularism does not address. Cannot address. It's arbitrary that certain things are considered religious and others, other sets of beliefs are not. And then how the way that the uh, secular West constructs religion in this way, constructs religion in this way, um, is in the service of its of state interests, state and corporate interests. Okay, so let's continue and, and we'll elaborate on these points. All right, but, uh, but do you understand if the minister in Denmark, um, do you understand if they find this preach controversial? If they want to censor me for something that I wrote 20 years ago, and I'm not even going to Denmark and, um, and I'm not at the border, then what are we allowing that government to do to other people. So I'm even asking for you, if you're a reporter in Denmark, what if tomorrow they don't like what you said? Are they going to censor you? Are they going to ban you from um, European countries? Because they don't like who decides what is liked and what is not liked. And I actually looked this up in the Danish um, legal code that anyone is entitled to, uh, to in print writing and speech to publish his or her thoughts censorship and other preventive measures can never again be introduced. That's Article 77. So you actually think uh, our government is breaking their own laws? Let's look at the facts, what was done to me, in that, uh, and then they're breaking their own law. And I'm also saying that the people that are really harmed from this are the, uh, are the Danish people. All right. All right so what... Uh uh, Muhammad Sharif is doing here is appealing to freedom of speech. He's saying that the Danish people are harmed when the government restricts speech. Uh, so this is his this is the strategy that he's using to argue that Denmark banning him uh, is is wrong and um, is contrary to 
the interests of Europeans and Danish people in particular. So he's appealing to the value of freedom of speech. And we'll see how well this strategy really plays out. I would like to go through to the second um, example uh, of the documentation they uh, sent to me. It's a preach, um, or it's an article written by you, uh, and you're talking about television as the third parent. You're saying that television is harmful to Muslim beliefs and state of society because it includes the presentation of bad morals, nakedness, tempting scenes, immoral pictures and destructive speech. And now I would like to ask you if you think this preach is clashing with the freedom of information, religion and speech we have in Denmark. You don't have to be. So this is what the reporter does. Uh, and she clearly had this prepared um, to trap him. But basically, as soon as he appealed to freedom of speech, then she goes and brings something from his past where he's saying that you have TV spreading immorality. TV is spreading all kinds of harmful uh, messages to children. And we have to, in, in a sense, restrict. Like there needs to be restrictions on what can be shown on TV. And this is something that is very logical. And even non-Muslims would accept that Yeah, there are certain things that we shouldn't be propagating on, on, and broadcasting on television stations and so forth that we shouldn't expose people to. But the but this reporter is using it to say that well, according to you, in certain cases, speech is it's a good thing to restrict speech. It's preventing harm to restrict speech. So how do you respond to that? Aren't it? It seems like according to this article of your past, you're against freedom of speech. So aren't you being a hypocrite by now invoking freedom of speech when it affects you, when it affects your ability to uh, travel to Denmark and to uh, preach your ideas? So this was a, a trap that they set for him. And this is always going to be a trap. This is always going to be a trap for Muslims when they invoke the value of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is not an Islamic value. Um, in Muslim society, uh, if a, a Muslim society that is run according to the Sharia and that upholds the Sharia, upholds the divine law, there are many restrictions on what people can say, in particular, uh, blasphemy against Allah, blasphemy against God, insulting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, insulting any Prophet, uh, any of the messengers, This is all restricted and there are very high penalties, severe consequences, apostasy, leaving Islam and then, and then uh, people being uh, becoming aware of that, that you've left Islam. Apostasy also has implications for freedom of speech. And so these are freedom of speech is not a value that's upheld within the uh, within the Sharia. And so whenever any uh, interviewer can pin the Muslim. If you say that, oh, well, freedom of speech is something that we need as a defense of your own speech, then the inter any smart interviewer should say that, well, what about Islamic law? What about blasphemy? What about the fact that in, in according to Islamic law, there are these kinds of penalties and consequences for um, blasphemy and insulting the Prophet Wasallam and so forth? Any smart interviewer would immediately go to that. Because then the Muslim has nowhere to go. Either say, yeah, well, I guess freedom of speech, uh, you know, there has to be limits uh, to speech. Or either they'll admit, have to admit that and, and backtrack. Or they'll have to say, well, I don't agree with the Sharia. I don't agree with what Islamic law has to say with this. Or that's irrelevant. Like Islamic law is only for the past and now we're in a different time. And so it's not applicable. So this is this is the kind of trap where you have to respond, you know, one way or the other. The correct response uh, when it comes to freedom of speech is to say that freedom of speech is something that is not uh, respected in any part of the world. Freedom of speech is a mirage. It's something that doesn't actually exist. And the Western philosopher who most eloquently argued this is named Stanley Fish. Stanley Fish, and he wrote a book 
called There's No Such Thing as Free Speech, and it's a good thing too. And he makes a very simple argument. It's not difficult to understand, but speech can be harmful. Speech can cause a lot, great deal of harm. It can cause a great deal of suffering. And so speech is something that just like actions can affect people in profound ways and in profoundly destructive ways. So just like we have laws that restrict people from inflicting harm, that restrict people from actions that will damage them, we also, by that same token, have to restrict speech. By that same token, we have to have laws that res restrict speech, restrict people from being able to cause harm in this way. And as a matter of fact, all countries, all of these uh, quote unquote free speech countries have laws that prevent uh, this kind of harm. For example, you have libel laws, libel. Right. If you deliberately lie about someone to harm them, especially if it's you want to harm their business or you want to harm a corporation, you libel, then this is something that you can be prosecuted for um, fighting words. You know, if you go and you start provoking someone, you start insulting their mother. This can be restricted. This kind of speech can be restricted. You can be held liable for those kinds of fighting words, copyright laws. Your ability to just copy someone else's work and publish it under your own name. That is a restriction on freedom of speech. You, this is a certain kind of speech that you can't engage in and you can face severe penalties for that. So the, and, and behind all of these kinds of restrictions is the understanding that these types of speech cause harm. These types of speech cause harm and therefore the state is justified in restricting them. So free speech does not exist in an absolute sense anywhere. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing that free speech doesn't exist anywhere. It cannot exist anywhere. Every institution, every society has norms on what is correct and proper uh, speech and what is beyond the pale and should not be said. Otherwise, you will face severe consequences and penalties. The only difference between these Western societies and the Sharia centered society is on the definition of harm, on, on defining what indeed is harmful and what Islam recognizes, what we recognize through Islam and through the message of Allah is that defaming, blaspheming, insulting Allah, insulting Islam, this is the pinnacle of harm. This is the pinnacle of harming people because it is taking people away from Allah. It is creating doubts in Allah and therefore threatens their afterlife. It, it, it uh, threatens their afterlife because of disbelief. So this is the pinnacle of harm. This is the pinnacle of danger. Of course, we have to restrict speech that can cause this kind of harm. Of course, we have to restrict uh, the kinds of uh, writing and speaking and presenting and broadcasting that threatens people's iman because that's where the, pin the epitome of harm can be done is to a person's heart, to their qalb, to the qulub of people. So the sharia is in fact protecting people in the best way by restricting this kind of uh, harmful speech. And all of these other countries, they just have a different understanding of harm. Again, their understanding of harm is based on what? On their secular musings, their secular philosophies, you know, whatever their the latest philosopher or thinker has conjured up and they debate and they argue and they uh, fight on what is truly harmful, what is truly beneficial, who knows? Right? It's just it's just fun. They're engaged in fun speculation. They have no certainty. They have no certain knowledge. OK, so that's what their understanding of harm and the restrictions of speech are based on fun. Our restrictions are based on haq, on yaqeen, on what Allah, the creator, has laid out within the sacred law. So the difference is between night and day. The difference is between night and day. And so 
you know, something like this, a version of this, you can say, like, as very practically, you can speak like this. You should speak like this to non-Muslims. Okay, I assume that non-Muslims are watching this broadcast. There are non-Muslims who are watching this. And so this is how we should talk because we're reorienting the conversation to, okay, well, there's a creator. The creator has sent a message. What is the content of this message? What is the guidance of this message? This is our da'wah. This is our inviting everyone. This is our invitation to humanity. Please, we care about you. We, ca- we want the best for you. Leave the von, leave the specula- speculative philosophies. Leave this kind of, uh, you know, cultural beliefs that change every so often. Like this is a question for non-Muslims. Like, haven't you wondered how drastically right and wrong changes within your cultural history, and how people's understanding of what is right and wrong changes with the time? Why is that? Shouldn't right and wrong be universal? Shouldn't right and wrong be consistent? Could it be that what is considered right and wrong it, by your society is so unanchored that it's just flowing with the tide, with the time? Don't you think there needs to be a standard? Like, don't you think life has a purpose? Don't you think that we have a purpose? Or do you think that this is all a game? Like your your 60, 70, 80 years in, on this earth is just for nothing. Anyway, this is these are the kinds of things that we have to reorient people towards. Muslim to know that, hey, there's some stuff on TV I don't want my children to see. So all right, let's go back to uh, the interview. I don't I don't know. But I don't know what the ministry's point is on, on that one. I, th- I don't know, but I think uh, they are reacting on the freedom of information we have in Denmark, because I think, like, okay. I, I'm not sure. But do you think this clashes with the freedom of information? So what do you mean by freedom of information? Like um, the freedom of people to publish whatever they want? On publish TV? and read and, like, um, be able to get the information they want. Yeah. So that's exactly what I'm, I'm saying that so we should all be, I'm not saying that somebody on TV can't do that. In fact, again, this actually kind of goes to the, the, um, the silliness of these things, but even if they didn't publish it on TV, they can publish it on the internet. Again, this was a speech from 2000. And so, so anybody can publish whatever they want. That has nothing to do with me. The Danish ministry uh, see you as a threat. All right. So see, he had to, he had to concede that point. He had to concede that, well, whoever wants to print or publish anything, uh, they should have the right to do that. But this is very relevant. This is relevant for two reasons. One, because of uh, Denmark's history of uh, publishing and broadcasting anti-Islam material. For example, the Danish cartoons of the Prophet Sallallahu number that's number one that's relevant like are we fine with that like do we think that everyone should have the right to do that no of course not of course not and then secondly if you say that yeah people should have the right to publish whatever they want and to broadcast whatever they want on tv there should be no restriction well there is a there is a larger issue here there's a larger framework or, or a larger context that we have to be cognizant of these countries like Denmark and the West generally is pressuring the Muslim world to adopt their liberal standards. They're pressuring the Muslim world to adopt these kinds of uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion standards. And so when you have preachers, prominent uh, imams like Muhammad al-Sharif, like Mufti Mink, uh, basically endorsing freedom of speech, then that can be used against the Muslim world. That can be used against NGO. That can NGOs, government agencies, uh, Western media can say, "Look at these hypocritical Muslims. They're preaching freedom of speech, freedom of religion in the West, 
They're preaching all of these liberal secular ideals. They're saying that Western values are Islamic values. Well, then why aren't, why aren't they implementing that in the Muslim world? Why are they not implementing that in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Turkey? Why? This is, a, these, this is the, the hypocrisy of Muslims. This is the incoherence of Islam. This is what this is the larger context of the discourse here. So you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful in what you're endorsing and you have to think beyond the implications. Like I'm sure again like this is not like when when you reach a certain kind of prominence or, or a certain level of prominence uh, like Mufti Mink and Muhammad al-Sharif uh, you're going to, you represent more than yourself. You represent more than yourself. You're speaking on behalf of the Ummah, in a sense, to the Danish people or to these specific uh, Danish people who are questioning you and questioning your religion. So think about it in that kind of broader sense and understand what are the implications for the rest of the Muslim world by the kinds of things that I endorse. To the public order. Do you think your preachers um, are threatening to the public order? So my preachers are threatening to the public order or me, myself? Maybe both. What do you think? Am I a threat to the public order? If I ever went to Denmark one day, and hopefully, you know, these things can be reformed and resolved, and I'm happy to talk about it. But if I ever went to Denmark one day, this is what I would do. I would sit in a cafe, and I would, um, you know, look at the candles, and I would observe the fuga, and I would go home after that. That's it. I would not give any speeches. I would not speak to anybody. I'm an introvert. I like to read books and sit at home and keep to myself. And in fact, and this is kind of like a side point here, and that is the dissemination of information nowadays is not done by public speeches. That may have been 20 years ago or in the past, but nowadays the dissemination of information education is done online. So it's probably been about six years that I have not given any public speeches. So the public order, like, oh, I'm in town, therefore, public order, so what am I going to do? I'm going to, like, go into the city center and say, hey, everybody, I want to give a speech. And oh, everybody's like, oh, yes, he's nobody even knows me in Denmark. And all I would go is have a cup of tea and sit. And I wasn't going to anyway, but just uh, letting you know. So am I a threat to the public order? Absolutely not. In fact, if there's a threat happening here, it's allowing politicians and the minister to... Um, to implement censorship on people. It, uh, censorship on people even that have, there's no provocation. Hmm. What are your general... All right, so this is, again, he's re-emphasizing that censorship is bad. And then also when he's saying that, you know, I don't have any desire to do any public preaching. Um, I'm not a threat to the public order. Well... How does that really address that argument like from the Danish minister, from this reporter? They claim that, well, some Muslims, some imams are a threat to the public order. Uh, they are preaching these kinds of hateful verses from their book and they practice things like fasting during Ramadan. This is this causes a problem to the public order. They get angry and they get upset whenever we publish cartoons mocking their religion and mocking their prophets. All I saw them. So these are all things that are disturbing the public order within Denmark and within European Europe generally. And that's why we're justified in banning and preventing Muslim imams from coming to our countries. And if they're in our countries, we're going to prevent them from having any kind of public platform. We're going to make sure that they're not in uh, able to speak publicly at the masjid. And we need to only have the uh, government approved imams who are allowed to give the khutbah. Only government approved imams are allowed to read from a script basically when they teach in the mosques. And Furthermore, we have to limit uh, the internet activity 
and the kind of video content that is coming from these hate preachers because the internet can affect public order just as much as public speech does, as you, Muhammad al-Sharif, have recognized and told us. So this is the implication of, of the things that he is saying. Um, it, it's basically reaffirming what the foreign minister has done in banning hate preachers. And in fact, he's essentially giving a justification for more kinds of restrictions, more restrictions on Muslim speech. So this is, this is the trap. This is the trap that you fall into when you make the mistake of affirming uh, affirming uh, freedom of speech and saying that this is an important value and as Muslims, that's our value and we support it and we're all about uh, freedom of speech. We shouldn't ban and censor and so forth. Okay. Well, considerations about Denmark and the West, other Western countries. So I'm uh, Canadian and um, I've uh, born and raised in Canada. The Western values are my values. I know, and in fact, uh, my parents immigrated from Egypt in the 1970s to Canada. I have not been back to Egypt. Um, I went when I was a child um, twice, but I haven't been back to Egypt in about 30 years. So English is my first language. And um, I kind of, I can speak a little bit of Arabic broken, but uh, this is who I am, this is my life. And everything in the Western values are, um, are my values. All right. Um, the so yeah, I think that it's, it's a problem when we try to prove our Westernness. Um, we're Western enough, please accept us. We should have this kind of, you know, is that for, yeah, we're Muslims. Like, this is who we are. You don't like it? Fine. That's your problem. That's not our problem. We're not seeking out your acceptance. We're not trying to get you to accept us and to value us. We, we're just offering one simple thing. The truth. Evaluate it. Consider the truth. And we'll do our best to present it in the best way, to explain it and to argue for it in the best way with wisdom uh, and good counsel. This is Islam. You don't have to like us. You don't have to accept us. You don't have to... This is the message. We're just delivering it. We're just delivering the message. Leads me to uh, uh, the next uh, part of this interview. I would like to go through like a checklist with you. I would just like you to answer yes or no. Uh, do you believe? All right. So this is really demeaning. Like I have a checklist for you. This is the checklist to see if you're civilized enough, if you're enlightened enough, if you're human enough. You know, just answer yes or no. So this is very demeaning um, to to subject anyone to that. When equal rights between women and men. Absolutely, actually, it's Islam that that teaches us equal rights between women and men for sure. Right. The question: Are there equal rights between women and men in Islam? Yes or no? Actually, did she, she asked? Um, oh, let's re rewind that. Because the wording is important. Is it okay to be a homosexual? Oh, let's see. Like a checklist with you? I would just like you to answer yes or no. Uh, do you believe in equal rights between women and men? Wait, do you believe in equal rights between women and men? She didn't ask about Islam. She said, do you believe in equal rights between women and men? That can, that can be relevant, uh, the, the wording of the question. Because if, because so what he says is, yes, absolutely, Islam is teaching equal rights between women and men. So this is, again, you're setting yourself up for questioning. You're setting yourself up uh, for being asked questions that are not going to be as easily addressed with just saying, yes, there are equal rights between men, men and women. Because she could say, well, what about inheritance in Islamic law? What about when it comes to the witness? 
and how two, in certain cases, two uh, female witnesses are equal to a, one male witness. Um, she can ask about spousal authority within Islam. Uh, she can ask about uh, the necessity of the wali in marriage, for example. And on and on, so many examples that she can bring. Maybe she hasn't done the research, but in other interviews, these issues do come up. And you have to have a better answer than just say, oh, Islam uh, acknowledges that women and men are equal. Men and women are different. Allah has created, the Creator has created men and women differently and has made them suitable for different kinds of ways of living their lives, different roles within uh, society, within the family, within marriage. This is a function of differences. The differences within Islamic law and the treatment of men and women stem from these differences in the way that we have been created by the Creator. And no one can deny that men and women are different that we are different biologically, we are different psychologically, we are different mentally, and so on and so forth. This is something that's undeniable, even according to Western research. And so that's why um, we have uh, differences in, uh, in the Sharia, in Islamic law, in, in the roles of, between the genders. I mean, this is, this is still a uh, simplified answer, and there's much further detail that needs to be unpacked, but for the purposes of a simple interview like this, uh, you can give an answer that's not going to set you up uh, to get cornered later on, or give the wrong impression to your listeners, to Muslim listeners, who will say, oh, well, you know, the Sheikh has said that men and women are equal. Then why is my local Imam saying that, oh, women don't, uh, men have this role, women have this role, men and women have different roles in Islam? Is my imam, my local imam confused? Is my local imam distorting Islam? Is he uh, imparting a misogynist reading and interpretation of Islam? And he's trying to sell it off as authentic? Because I'm listening to um, Muhammad al-Sharif saying something completely different. So this is, uh, this is the tension. Okay, continuing. Absolutely. Actually, it's Islam that, that teaches us equal rights between women and men, for sure. All right. Is it okay to be a homosexual? Yes. Should I? I think that the distinction has to be made when responding to this question between having uh, same-sex attractions or having same-sex desires versus acting on those desires and feeding into those desires and dwelling on those desires and trying to strengthen those desires. So these are the, these are the distinctions that are found within Islamic thought, within the Islamic scholarly tradition. And you know it's very clear that sometimes there are people who they, for whatever reason, this is their test, they're tested with being attracted to the same sex in a sexual way. They have like sexual desire for uh, the same sex. So is it okay? So is it okay to have those desires? Well, it's outside of your control. You can't control if you have those desires. Um, so that's an irrelevant question. It's a non sequitur. But the question, what you do have a choice is to dwell on those desires, to strengthen those desires, to act on those desires, to feel justified in acting on those desires. Those are things that you can control and you therefore are morally culpable for within Islamic law and Islamic ethics more broadly. So uh, this is the kind of distinction that we have to make instead of just accepting the terms and the, the vocabulary that are fed to us like we have this there's homosexuality and there's LGBT and you can be gay or lesbian and there's sexual orientation and blah 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 all of these categories we have to question we have to put things in our terms okay so this is an important tip for anyone who is being interviewed or has to explain this issue don't panic okay when you're asked about homosexuality don't panic. Just go back to the first step, and this gives you some time to regroup. Go back to explaining, okay, according to Islam, and Islam is elucidating what is the true nature of this issue, 
there's a difference between uh, what someone desires and what they are attracted to versus how they behave and how they act. Okay? Start with that distinction and explain. Present the Islamic ontology, the Islamic ontology of desire and, and attraction and sexuality. We shouldn't just assume the Western modern paradigm, which is, by the way, constantly changing according to the whims of these activists and these LGBT promoters. Uh, we need to center our paradigm. We need to center Islam, our uh, the correct understanding, the correct understanding of reality that's based, again, on what? On haq, not on van. Okay, continuing. Woman be able to shake hands with a man? Of course. Yes. Do you believe in freedom of religion? Of course, absolutely, 100%. Do you believe in democracy? Yes. Um. All right. So, like I said, the checklist is extremely demeaning and basically forcing someone to answer yes or no. And so, I mean, all of these answers, you can easily be trapped. Someone who, or an uh, interviewer who is more uh, educated or aware of different aspects of Islamic law would have would have gone, you know, on a rampage just dissecting all of those admissions and it would make the interviewee look very bad uh, when it comes to you know religious freedom you know shaking hands contact between uh, non-mahram men and women uh, democracy uh, all of these things there are in there are different answers that you can give that are more nuanced and are more true to what Islam actually teaches okay so, um, yeah, like for example, uh, men and women touching hands. Just explain that. What does Islam have to say about contact between men and women who are not married? And this is something that you can explain very easily that people can understand. W what kind of, what is the destruction that is caused by that? The harm that is caused by that kind of um sexual promiscuity there's deep harms there's deep harms to the individual spiritually and even psychologically and you can cite studies you can cite articles you can cite research that shows what is the psychological damage caused when you're just engaged in a series of casual sexual encounters so if you can see the damage of that, if you can see the damage of fornication, and I've argued this in our previous episodes, and we're running out of time, so I don't want to belabor it, but there are all of these dangers and damages and harms that you can cite for these kinds of sexual behaviors. A sense that these things are not right. Okay, When you show, they've done experiments of, sh I mean, depraved experiments of showing children pornography, young children. And just by being exposed to them, the researchers were s s noting their reactions and the children were crying. They're disturbed, like what's going on? So this is something natural. This is something that we all sense. It's only the cultural context that is destroying the fitra, is constantly telling us, no, engage in depravity. No, you have to, if you truly want to be free, if you truly want to be enlightened, you have to be okay with practicing this kind of ca casual sex and the and the genders need to be constantly mixing with each other and connected with each other and touching each other and hugging and kissing each other this is what enlightenment means why should we accept this just because the rest of society has been brainwashed into thinking this doesn't mean we have to uh, appease their delusions that we have to cater to their delusions no, our responsibility is to wake them up. Our responsibility is to wake them up and say, 
Look at how you're living your life. This is not how you should be living your life. This is not helping you. This is not how you can, you, uh, can succeed in this life and the next life. This is not what you were put on this earth for. So these are the kinds of conversations that we need to have with our friends and family. The Danish uh, Ministry of Integration and Foreign Justice uh, has a list of hate preachers on the website. And okay, so this is now uh, Mufti Mink. You have been on the list since the 28th of November 2018. How were you told about you being on the list? Well, you are the person who actually sent me an email to tell me you are on this list. I thought it was a prank because my work is all about love and integration and peace. And I know over the years we all have developed and we have all become more conscious of coming together and respecting each other. All right, so right off the bat, uh, he's talking about integration. Um, so I don't know if he knows the context of talking about integration and Muslims integrating in society. And what Inga Stoiberg and these far right on the in in Europe are talking about constantly is that Muslims need to integrate. Muslims need to integrate into our societies. Um, they and the only way to really integrate is by leaving Islam or leaving Islamic practice. Right? Don't fast in Ramadan. Don't pray five times a day. Don't leave your job on Fridays to go pray Salat al Jum'ah. Because this is not what we do culturally in Europe. So if Muslims are doing it, they're not properly integrated into Europe. So this is the conversation. This is why Denmark has banned. Uh, have they banned or they proposed banning halal meat? They're trying to ban halal meat. Why? Because this is something that is contrary. Slaughtering an animal. Uh, through you know cutting the neck this is something that is uh, contrary to uh, Danish understanding of humane treatment of animals and so Muslims it doesn't matter what their religion says we ban halal circumcision is banned in many European countries it's banned in Iceland parents cannot choose to have their sons circumcised sons or daughters so this is something that again our culture and our value says something and your religion something says something else you have to leave those aspects of your religion in order to integrate with european society so this is the larger context uh, of this entire interview and discussion and so when mufti Menk says oh i am all about integration well what is what is the implication of that? Yeah, uh, this person, I can't pronounce their username, username is saying that, yeah, circumcision is uh, banned within these European countries, but they can choose to castrate themselves if, uh, you know, someone chooses to become a girl from a boy. And yeah, so parents can decide to give a child uh, hormones, uh, give them sex change surgery, those kinds of changes that mutilate the body, that harm the body, uh, that's perfectly uh, legitimate because it's for the purpose of gender identity. But a uh, Muslim parent can't decide to uh, circumcise for a religious on a religious basis. This is the uh, kind of thinking that liberal secularism engenders. Okay, back to uh, Mufti Mink. So I was very shocked, I was sad, but there, the, the, after you told me and after I, you know, you, uh, the email between you and I mm -hmm. happened, I went onto the list of the link that you showed me and I was just, I was just sad. I started praying for uh, the, the, the lady who put me on there and I, I actually learned how to say her name properly you know her name is Inga Stoibel exactly so I was praying for 
I was praying for her because I think she is a good woman, but maybe she doesn't understand. The kind of extremely uh, disgusting comments that she makes about Muslims and what she's trying to do to Muslims in Denmark and elsewhere in, in the European Union. So, I mean, when it comes to certain people that are insulting Islam, attacking Islam, attacking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not about our personal, it's not an attack on us personally, right? When, when these insults are happening, someone is attacking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't have the right to reciprocate with kindness and, oh, you know, you're just, you're a nice lady. I'm sure you're a nice lady that you're promoting insulting of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In those cases, uh, there has to be a difference. Attack on Islam, an attack on the, an attack on the Prophet Sallallahu And so this is something that uh, Mufti Menk, of course, knows. What she is doing sometimes, because to put someone like me there, I was just very surprised. I am full of love, full of kindness, full of reaching out to people who differ from me. I can send you more than 1,000 uh, sentences of mine that I have set, set in the public domain that proves that I actually promote people to respect someone whom you are different, different from. Maybe your culture is different and you know every country you go there is a different culture, there is different norms. Mm -hmm. uh, we respect all the people and all their cultures and we don't try to impose what we have on someone else. And I have said this millions of times. All right, so this is a problem to say that we respect people Regardless, it's the same issue that I pointed out with uh, the previous interview with Muhammad al-Sharif. Uh, so we don't respect everyone's belief. Like if you believe that Allah had a son, um, we, I don't respect that belief. Muslims don't respect that belief. It's falsehood. It's kufr. It's a bad belief. It's going to harm you. It's going to harm society. It's going to harm everyone in this life and the next. We don't. There's nothing respectable about it. There's nothing respectable about uh, that kind of... Uh, falsehood so we shouldn't make these kinds of broad statements about oh we love everyone everyone is we respect everything no that's not the case do we respect people's humanity uh, yes so people are human beings we do respect the fact that they're human beings but that doesn't mean we respect them as belonging to a certain religion no Mm. But uh, actually, you are not only banned from entering Denmark. Uh, when you are on the list, you are banned from entering any of the Schengen countries. It's 26 countries. Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, actually, I, I, I didn't really plan to go to any of those countries uh, as yet. So I was sad because obviously, uh, uh, if you were to ask my followers, and even if uh, Sister Inga Stoiber was to follow me on Twitter for five days or ten days, she will change her mind. I am 100% certain that she will see that I made a mistake. Uh, and But unfortunately, it looks like maybe someone must be on a witch hunt to try to just find people with a beard who might be very popular, very famous. Maybe they will look at one, two things that might have been said in the past. Uh, and you know, we develop over time. We say things differently over time. We change our minds over time. So uh, to say you are banned from 20, 30 countries without giving me a chance to, you know, a court case, a hearing, I don't mind. You can ask me, talk to me, mm -hmm. communicate with me. I believe if someone does bad to you, you don't need to do bad back to them. You just need to continue to be good because someone's bad behavior must not change your good behavior, you know? I would like to talk to you about uh, some of the documentation the ministry sent me. Uh, the documentation which uh, justifies putting you on the list. Yeah. The first one is a tweet from you. Um, it's a tweet from January 2012. And it says that pornography is the reason why okay, we okay. have homosexuals. Okay, okay, if you could just hold on. Yes. It was tweeted in 2012. Now, I, I started using Twitter in 2011. In 2012, maybe I had 100, 200 followers. The tweet you're talking about, uh, it says, Pornography leads to, 
leads to, can lead to, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it has one, I think it has seven likes and one retweet, that tweet. And it was posted in 2012. Uh, you must remember something, I come from Zimbabwe, I come from a, a third world country, I was brought up in a country where you talk about homosexuality, if you promote it, up to today it is banned, it is illegal in this country, not only in this country, but many, many countries. And, you know, we, we are taught from when we were young from the school that, you know what, it's not allowed and so on. So as you grow uh, and you travel, you begin to learn, you begin to see. There was a time when I spoke about so this is not good at all uh, to say that in the countries, the third world countries that I am from and I frequent, uh, you're taught from a young age that this is wrong, that practicing homosexual behavior is wrong, but then you travel and you grow and you learn. So this is not like, this is not a good message uh, that he's sending to the interviewer, the Danish people, and for Muslims generally. Homosexuals, and I said that in my lecture in 2009, which is many, many years ago, I said that homosexuals are worse than animals. And after, uh, I, after I was corrected by someone, I actually have a retraction on my website and on my Facebook and on a lot of my pages where I said, uh, what I said was actually wrong, and it was based on a misnotion. We cannot say. Okay. Why is it wrong? Someone is worse than an animal, and you know you need to understand human beings and understand. No, it's not wrong. Uh, we do say that because of certain behaviors that people do, it can take them to be worse than animals. Uh, to engage and to feed your desires. Uh, to feed the, the nafs, to feed your shahawat, uh, to get into this uh, debased state where your desires are king, your desires are ruling over you, then yes, this will take you down to below the level of an animal. This is very clear and Allah is very clear about it in the Quran as well. Allah mentions this. So there's nothing wrong with saying that uh, engaging in your desires is going, it can take you down this road of making less than an animal at a lower level than an animal. Um, so you shouldn't apologize for that. You can just, again, redirect the conversation, like explain Islam's ontology, Islam, explain the terminology explain the concepts educate people this is part of a this is part of dawah a big part of dawah don't just answer the question the way they want you to answer it they're imposing on you they're imposing their world view okay you want to use the word world the word world view they're imposing that on you they're imposing their view of the world their opinions about what the world consists of Okay. Don't fall into that trap. No, we don't accept this worldview. What we counteract your worldview with is truth. And I don't say, I never say Islamic worldview. Never say Islamic worldview because worldview is perspectival. It's a subjectivist postmodern term like oh everyone has different world views there's no we can't know the truth we just have different views of the world no it's not our view it's not our perspective it's not our opinion no it's the truth this is what the truth is this is what reality is you have your world view your opinions and we have the truth and we can explain it to to you with wisdom and compassion and mercy without compromising that truth. Let's continue. And that they're, they're honorable. And you know, when you look at pornography, if your country allows the pornography, then I don't know that. And I didn't say uh, that you must break the law of the country.
why can someone hold that against me? If someone else wants to do anything, they can drink alcohol, for example. Some people don't drink alcohol. They can eat meat. Some people don't eat meat. Hmm. Uh, some people only eat organic food. Some people say, say that organic food is bad. All of this does not make a person a criminal, but it's their little freedom for as long as they respect the other opinions and they are promoting respecting the difference. If you Google my name, Mufti Menk, respecting the difference, you will find so many lectures I have given to hundreds of thousands of people in stadiums across the globe telling them to respect the differences that you have with other people. All right. So, right, so this is setting yourself up because the interviewer could ask, well, alcohol is actually not allowed in many Muslim countries. Uh, if you respect the difference then you should, these Muslim countries should respect the fact that some people enjoy alcohol. Some people like to drink it and liquor up. So why are they prevented from that? Why is the law preventing from, uh, fr them from practicing what they believe to be true? Isn't this hypocritical of you to uh, preach respecting the difference, but your own Muslim countries, the third world countries that you're from, uh, don't allow this? Maybe just like you learned about homosexuality and you grew in your understanding of homosexuality, you can grow in your understanding of alcohol. You can grow in your understanding of uh, all of these issues so that the Muslim world can grow and become enlightened and learn from us, the superior West. You don't believe that uh, pornography can lead to uh, homosexuality uh, anymore? Uh, to be honest with you, pornography can lead to so many things. It can lead to lack of sleep, number one. It will waste your internet sometimes. It depends how, how much you're watching it. And if I believe that I shouldn't be watching it, my children should not be watching it. Uh, and if you believe you want to watch it, if, if uh, there are... So again, he keeps going back to this perspectivalism. Like, I believe that it's bad to watch pornography. But if you believe that it's good, well, then I respect the difference. No, like this is this is relativism in the extreme sense of relativism. Just because someone believes what they're doing is right and moral doesn't mean it's right and moral. So he's conceding all of these points. He's conceding it when he says, well, I believe this. This is what is my personal opinion, but you're free to believe whatever you want and I respect you. I respect that difference. No, this is, no one has this kind of relativistic standard of morality. The West certain, it certainly is not relativistic in this way. Western uh, secular liberals are not uh, relativistic in this way because the liberal, take the most liberal person that you know, the person who's most committed to secularism and ask them, Okay, you respect differences, you, you have your own opinion, but you respect the opinions of others. Well, can you respect me if I'm a racial supremacist? Can you respect me if I think that uh, men are superior to women, like some kind of misogynistic sexist view? Can you respect me if I uh, believe that you know, uh, LGBT is wrong? Can you respect me? If I think that LGBT is something that is damaging and destructive, can you respect me? Uh, or any other view, like I'm just giving you examples off the top of my head. Misogyny, racism, homophobia, uh, transphobia, all of these terms. No, and that liberal will say, no, I won't respect you for those beliefs. You're wrong. You're wrong about racial su superiority. You're wrong about male superiority. You're wrong about this and that they're absolutists not relativists when it comes to these issues only when it comes to religious things religious beliefs is everyone is the same and oh who can say what's right and wrong and it's all just a matter of perspective but when it comes to these things that actually matter to them and actually are a significant part of their understanding of right and wrong then they're absolutists they're absolutists. So this is, again, a hip, hypocrisy of the Western mentality, the modernist, liberal, secular mentality that you can exploit, that you can exploit and you can point out and you can press them on. 
So why should I be a relativist when it comes to what my religion is teaching me, what God has said? Why should I be a relativist about God's message? But you're an absolutist about your values. You're an absolutist about your beliefs. Well, guess what? I'm an absolutist too. I'm wrong, or I'm right, and you're wrong. You're wrong for thinking that it's perfectly fine to engage in these kinds of behaviors, to uh, spread and promote pornography all over the world. You're wrong. I'm an absolutist about it, about that. And my absolutism is based on the truth, on the, the message that the Creator has sent to all of humanity. Your absolutism it changes every, every few years. <laughs> Your absolutism is limited to one particular cultural moment in time. So it's it's even self-contradictory. So this is the kind of the kind of things that I would recommend saying to this line of questioning. Continue. National studies on the internet that show you that pornography can lead to this. There is another professional study that says it cannot lead to this. So if there are two or three professional studies, surely the freedom of the human beings, they can believe that it can lead. What I'm saying is very peaceful. I'm not promoting hatred or anything. Yeah. And to put me on a hate preacher's list because I might believe that pornography is something I shouldn't be doing. And, and I'm living far away. I'm living in a small country, one of the poorest countries in the whole world. I'm so famous now because if... In so, so he keeps diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. <clears throat> so, yeah, he, he, keeps, he keeps bracketing his claims. If I might believe that pornography leads to homosexuality, then... I, what difference does it make? I live so far away in this poor third world country. So this is just bracketing, 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 just boxing his beliefs to m minimize them, diminish them, as opposed to making a very strong statement. Is, what's wrong? Just say, it's fine to say these things. Yeah, I think, I believe that pornography, amongst many other things, can lead to same-sex attraction. I do think that Pornography leads to all kinds of degeneracy. It can lead to that. It can lead to many problems. This is something that is a worldwide problem. There's addiction, pornography addiction. This is a problem that we need to address. And as Muslims, we have the solution to this. We have a compassionate solution to this. We want to help people to get out of this addiction to pornography. In uh, recently, uh, I think it was Arizona, uh, the state declared that pornography is a public health crisis. I only cite that not to say that, oh, okay, if, if in the West they recognize it as a public health crisis, then Muslims, see, you know, Muslims are justified. No, I'm just citing as an example that even within their own thinking, within their own culture and thought, they've recognized that this is a big problem. Pornography is a big problem. And of course, it can lead to all kinds of degeneracy. Just make a strong statement. Make a clear, unambiguous statement. Stop bracketing. Stop making things wishy-washy. Stop making things ambiguous. This is, there's no need for it. There's no need for this. Yes, Toybe knows me. Wow, wow, I'm so happy. It's amazing for me because she's going to make me very, very famous. It's a preach where you are talking about having more than one wife, which is illegal in Denmark. Um, okay. But you uh, okay. you uh, de you deleted uh, this part from uh, Facebook. Actually, you deleted the tweet we talk about uh, we talked about before as well. Uh, how come you yes. deleted it? When you sent me this tweet of 2012, it had, I have a screenshot of it. It has uh, seven likes and one retweet, which is absolutely uh, negligible, which means it is very, very small. And I thought to myself, if this tweet is going to cause a problem in a country with its people, then I am bigger than a problem. I need to delete it so that the people of Denmark live in peace. So I deleted it to do a favor to Inge Stoibelt. So that's the reason why I took that out. I you're talking about... 
So this is, again, he's, um, he doesn't need to make these concessions. Like, I didn't want to disturb or cause problems for the people of Denmark or for the people of Europe or any other country. No, you're not causing problems. You're teaching people. You're educating them. You're giving by, uh, as a scholar, as a mufti, as an inheritor of the Prophet Sallallahu you are you are giving the message. You are you are giving guidance to people through your through your thought, your teaching, your tweets, and and your lectures, and so on and so forth. So this is something that you should uh, be proud of. You should accept and continue to promote, not apologize, not delete, not walk back. So on this issue, especially, this is the issue that the West amongst many issues are very confused about on homosexuality they need your medicine they need your medicine having more than one wife for example mm -hmm. so there are 60 countries in the world that actually have enshrined polygamy in a way that it happens uh, openly uh, maybe in your country it doesn't i don't know but uh, I, I whenever i have spoken about polygamy i have said something very clearly that lecture is not deleted completely. I just privatized it because, you see, I said in the lecture that I am not here to promote it, nor am I here to demote it. But I am letting you know that in Islamic values, it is permissible. So I am talking to you about Islamic values. It is allowed. But, um, but, what, but what about yourself? Do you have uh, more than one wife? Uh, I have more than one wife. I, I, I will respect them and I really, I, I don't promote it, I don't demote it. It's, it's very legal. I have not done anything illegal in the country where I live. I have proper documentation. If I was living in another country, I would not break the law of that country. So the thing is, uh, it, it, the, the, not just me, but with me, there are w almost one billion people. One okay, so he, he's appealing to legality which is just another way of avoiding the core issue. The core issue is, is it moral to have more than one wife? Is it moral for Muslim men to be involved in the, this polygamous relationship through marrying more than one wife? He's not addressing that. He's just saying that, well, it's legal. It's legal where I am, and it's legal in many Muslim countries. That doesn't address the moral issue, because if she wanted to, this interviewer, she could say, well, do you think that it's right? Do you think that it's something that it, it is acceptable morally? And then what would he say then? If he says that, yes, it is acceptable morally. Yes, it is something that uh, I think um, people should be allowed to practice. Then the laws that ban polygamy in the West are immoral the laws that are banning it in the united states and europe these are immoral laws and so th he's not addressing morality he's addressing legality and that's a way to avoid the crux of the issue so one person in the comments ayaz noor uh asks is there a chance the mufti means to say i respect your right to disagree as opposed to i respect your beliefs no matter what I respect your right to disagree as opposed to I respect your beliefs no matter what. No, this is still an issue. This is still an issue to say I respect your right to disagree. What does that mean? Again, go back to the example of the liberal. And will would the liberal say, like a completely liberal secular atheist, say, well, I respect the rights of white supremacists to think that they're the superior race. I respect... I respect their beliefs in racial superiority. I respect them to have the right to think that they're the racial that they're racially superior. No, no one would say this. We can't be relativists about these values and we can't hide again all of these different strategies, all these different ways to avoid making a moral claim like pornography can lead to same-sex attraction, which can lead to degenerate behavior that is damaging to a human being in this life and the next life. That is the moral claim that we should be making in a very strong way. That's part of what it means to be 
doing dawah and to teaching others and to spreading the message of Islam and helping others. But if we keep diminishing our message, bracketing it, putting this kind of, these relativistic clauses like in my opinion, in my view, what I think from my vantage point in this third world country, no, then you're not you're not really giving a strong message. You're confusing the issue. And and this polygamy question should be very simple. Like, uh, he actually he does mention this. I think let's just listen. One billion male and female who believe that there is absolutely nothing wrong if you do it respectfully. If you have, you know, the Mormon community in America, for example, they have many many wives. I only have two wives, for example. They are very good people. I respect them. We love each other so much. All of us, a big team. So nice. I mean, that's good. You should elaborate on that. Like, why not? Uh, why not explain to people uh, the benefits that you experience uh, by having more than one wife? There's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's a, that's a good message to give. So if the problem is with me in person, then I don't know. But if it is what I preach, she said I'm a hate preacher. I want to know how me having more than one wife myself is hate preaching. How is that hate preaching? The reason why they see you as a hate preacher is because they see you as a threat to the public order, meaning that um, your preaches undermines the Danish law and uh, values. Like I said, I invite my sister and she is a respected sister, Sister Inge Stoibel. She can follow me on Twitter or on, on, on Facebook or somewhere just for five days, even for one day. Even she can browse through, go see what I've said in the last two years. Because like you said, the ban is two years. So let's go back two years because you will see she will admit, she will smile, she will say this is a good man. And he's actually, I made a mistake. Let me remove this name from here. Yeah, so Inge Stoiberg is never going to say that Mufti Mink is a good man. The only way that she would say uh, Mufti Mink is a good man is if she were not aware of what he believes. Because he believes in Islam and he believes in the Sharia, he believes in Islamic law, he is a scholar uh, and, and he, has, he, he affirms the Qur'an, he affirms the truth of the Qur'an, every single ayah of the Qur'an, he affirms that. He affirms the words of the Prophet Sallallahu as a mufti, as a scholar. Therefore, so much, the only way that Inga Stoiberg or any of these far-right uh, liberal secular uh, individuals would accept Mufti Mink is if they didn't know what Islam is about. If they were ignorant of what these different ayat in the Quran are, are about. The only way that they would accept him is if Islam were completely compatible with liberal secularism, modern liberal secularism, which is impossible, which is just absolutely not the case. There's so many different conflicts. There's so many conflicts. We have to come to terms with this. Muslims need to come to terms with this fact. They're not going to accept us unless we adapt and we change and we integrate. This is just a truism. This is just the reality. We have, we have to be at the forefront of explaining to them how, yes, Islam does not conform to Western, modern, liberal secularism. Islam does not conform to it, but that's a good thing because that Western, modern, liberal secularism is so degenerate. It is so destructive. It is so corrupting. You're deluded into valuing it. You're deluded into thinking that this is the truth. All we're trying to do is show you the harm that is causing to you, to your families, to your future. So we're not going to adopt. We're not going to just because the medicine is bitter. That doesn't mean we throw out the medicine. Just because this is a bitter reality, you have to wake up. Okay, let's uh, listen to a few more minutes and then I'll conclude. I would like to um, go through a checklist with you 
Um, okay. And if it's well, possible, we'll I would just like you to answer uh, okay. yes or no. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first question. Do you believe in equal rights between women and men? Yes, absolutely. Equal rights between women and men. Men, I stand for it, I advocate it, and I agree with it. All right. Is it okay to be a homosexual? If a person wants to be, they are free to be a homosexual. If they don't want to be, they are free not to be a homosexual. But it's not okay to force anyone's opinion on another person. I personally am not homosexual, but I have interacted with so many people who are homosexual. They get along with me just like people who are uh, uh, who are Jewish and Christian and those who don't have a religion and, and so many other people, uh, Hindus and so... So this is a, a very wrong answer. Uh, as you should be able to tell by now if you've been paying attention and you should be able to understand why it's a wrong answer. Getting along with someone has nothing to do with the moral rightness or wrongness of their behaviors. Okay, We shouldn't approve of or respect things that are contradictory to Islam. Contradictory to the haq. That's a separate issue. So you can make these kinds of distinctions. You can make these kinds of distinctions. And again, you can also point out that there are some beliefs and there are some actions that are so problematic and that they're so degenerate that it's difficult. It's difficult to get along with someone or to consider. Again, it depends on what you mean by get along. Does it mean get along mean like, okay, I'm in the United States or I'm in Europe and my classmate or my coworker is this such a such person with this kind of beliefs okay well i'm going to get along with them in the sense that i'm not going to hurt them or i'm not going to uh you know insult them to their face or uh harm them in a specific way okay i'm getting along with them can i get along with them in the sense that oh i love you you're such a good friend you're my you know you're my best friend and let's spend some time together let's hang out come to my house no Absolutely not. Certain things I don't want in my house. Certain things I don't want to be associated with. Even I, even though I can get along with you in that way that I just explained and defined, but I'm it's that I, I just I'm not I'm disgusted by you, or I'm seriously offended or worried that you're going to have a bad effect on me or my family. And again, there's nothing. The liberal will say the same exact thing when it comes to their issues that they're absolutists about. Okay? Ask the liberal, are, can you get along with white supremacists? Can you get along with uh, rabid misogynists? Can you get along with uh, anti-Semites? Can you get along with them? Why can't you get along with them? Are you not tolerant? Are you an intolerant person? Why can't you respect the white supremacist? Why? This is intolerance. You have to respect people. You have to invite the white supremacist to your home. You have to give him a hug. You have to sit him at the dinner table and enjoy a respectful meal with the white supremacists. <laughs> Would they accept that? If you don't accept it, then why are you forcing me? Why are you demanding me? Why are you labeling me with these kinds of... In I'm an irrational barbarian. I don't understand pluralism and diversity because I don't want to uh, have those kinds of relations with people who have beliefs and, ha and are doing committing actions that are so contrary to truth and justice and morality. No, I don't want to have any association with that. Many more. Recently, I have more people who have told me, you know what, uh, this, I'm actually homosexual and so on. So it's a secular right to be or not to be. And this is why I say I'm not. And if someone else is not, then it doesn't mean they need to promote hatred. They need to promote, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the beating, the, the hitting, the, the, the killing of a person who chooses otherwise. All right. The next question. Can a woman shake hands with a man? Under certain circumstances, yes, she can. You know, in Islam, there is a teaching. 
and it's uh, in other religions there are teachings and it may be in Denmark there is a teaching in Zimbabwe there is a teaching so whatever your teaching is you follow it that's it you follow it if you believe yes yes if you believe no no I believe that you are totally free to shake the hand if you want to shake the hand what's your teaching my personal teaching well no, see so she kind of gets him He's, you're just making a descriptive statement by saying, well, some countries allow it, or in some cultures it's uh, acceptable, in other cultures it's not. He's just making a descriptive statement to avoid getting to the moral crux of the issue, but then she kind of presses him and says, okay, well, what's your teaching? I, uh, to be very honest with you, if, I'm, if I have to, I will. If I have to, I will. Okay. When do you have to? Whenever. It's just the circumstance. I mean, it's the circumstance. And everyone interprets their circumstance in a different way. It's fine. And I know there, there are times when I have, and there are times when uh, it, it is avoided. Like sometimes some people don't want to shake my hand because of my color. Sometimes some people don't want to shake my hand because of my, my beard. But in my heart, I love everyone. And, and to be honest with you, it's fine. You know, the, 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 whatever teaching you have, you follow it. That's it. Okay, I, so I have to be honest with you. I have, I have in the past. I have where I have been, where I have had to. Then I have. All right. So if I visited you in Zimbabwe, you will shake my hand. Well, if you extend, if you see my big beard and you extend your hand to me, who knows? I, I may shake it. I, I don't know at the time. I don't because I, I, I really don't know if you will even come to this country. But. Yeah, I, argumentatively, if you were to come, it's it's okay. I mean, I'm I'm not going to make you feel awkward and upset and so on. And even to be honest with you, uh, if you look at the Islamic teachings, there 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 is more than one ruling about the same thing. All right. Do you believe in freedom of religion? Absolutely yes. Freedom of religion. Everyone is allowed to choose whatever they want to believe, even within Islam. If they don't agree with you in the same sect, it's okay. We don't promote hate, so they can they can choose to be whatever they want. People can choose even not to have a religion. A lot of people don't believe in any religions. They are free. I believe in that freedom completely, and I do believe that a country like Denmark, uh, from what I learned about it before this, they're a country that promotes freedom freedom of speech freedom of religion freedom of everything so so yes i do believe in freedom of religion all right um the next one do you believe in democracy democracy is okay okay so hopefully by now you can based on everything that i've said before you can see that just endorsing freedom of religion freedom of speech all of this is problematic and uh, can be used against Muslims within the context of a given interview, but it can also be used against Muslims in a broader conversation uh, on why don't Muslim countries, why don't these Muslim nations implement freedom of religion, freedom of speech? Why don't they uh, you know, restrict the Sharia in those specific examples? I only wanted to give this kind of analysis uh, as a way to uh, raise awareness, raise awareness in the community about how liberal secular thought can shape and manipulate the way that we talk about Islam, the way that we do dawah, the way that we explain Islam, the way we understand Islam even uh, within our own hearts. So this is something that is a very subtle influence but it can have a big big impact it can have a big big impact so we have to be aware of uh, these traps we have to be aware of these uh, wrong ways of thinking about these issues and these questions and we have to aspire to a higher discourse we have to aspire to a more critical a more critical discourse that is able to understand all of the flaws in the western modern liberal secular way of thinking so that we can better appreciate the superiority, the wisdom, the truth of Islam, the truth of the message of Allah in the Quran and on the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is, this is my intention. This is why I want to focus on this and do a kind of breakdown. <laughs>
مهطعين مقنعي روسهم لا يرتد إليهم طرفهم وأفئدتهم وأنذر الناس يوم يأتيهم العذاب فيقول الذين ظلموا فيقول الذين ظلموا ربنا أخرنا إلى أجل قريب نجب دعوتك ونتبع الرسل أولم تكونوا وقسمتم من قبل ما لكم من زوال وسكنتم في مساكن الذين ظلموا أنفسهم وتبين لكم وتبين لكم كيف فعلنا بهم وضربنا لكم الأمثال وقد مكروا مكرهم وعند الله مكرهم وإن كان مكرهم لتزول منه الجبال فلا تحسبن الله مخلف وعده رسله إن الله عزيز ذو انتقام إذا جاءك المنافقون قالوا نشهد إنك لرسول الله والله يعلم إن إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين لكاذبون اتخذوا أيمانهم جنة فصدوا عن سبيل الله إنهم ساء ما كانوا يعملون ذلك بأنهم ثم كفروا فطبع على قلوبهم فهم لا يفقهون وإذا رأيتهم تعجبك أجسامهم وإن يقولوا تسمع لقولهم كأنهم خشب مسندة يحسبون كل صيحة عليهم هم العدو فاحذرهم هم العدو فاحذرهم قاتلهم الله أنا يؤفكون وإذا قيل لهم تعالوا يستغفر لكم رسول الله لووا رؤوسهم لو رؤوسهم ورأيتهم يصدون وهم مستكبرون سواء عليهم أستغفرت لهم أم لم تستغفر لهم لن يغفر الله لهم لن يغفر الله لهم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين هم الذين يقولون لا تنفقوا على من عند رسول الله حتى ينفضوا ولله خزائن السماوات والأرض ولكن المنافقين لا يفقهون يقولون لئن رجعنا إلى المدينة ليخرجن الأعز منها الأذل ولله العزة ولرسوله وللمؤمنين ولله العزة ولرسوله وللمؤمنين ولكن المنافقين لا يعلمون 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله ومن يفعل ذلك فأولئك هم الخاسرون وأنفقوا مما رزقناكم الموت فيقول رب فيقول رب لولا أخرتني إلى أجل قريب فأصدق فأصدق وأكن من الصالحين ولن يؤخر الله نفسا إذا جاء تحرم ما أحل الله لك تبتغي مرضاة أزواجك والله غفور رحيم قد فرض الله لكم تحلة أيمانكم والله مولاكم والله مولاكم وهو العليم الحكيم وإذ أسر النبي إلى بعض أزواجه حديثا فلما نبأت به وأظهره الله عليه عرف بعضه وأعرض عن بعض فلما نبأها به قالت من أنبأك هذا قال نبأني العليم الخبير إن تتوبا إلى الله فقد صوت قلوبكما وإن تظاهرا عليه فإن الله هو مولاه فإن الله هو مولاه وجبريل وصالح المؤمنين والملائكة بعد ذلك ظهير عسى ربه إن طلقكن أن يبدله أزواجا خيرا منكن مسلمات مسلمات مؤمنات قانتات تائبات عابدات تائبات عابدات سائحات ثيبات وأبكارا يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون يا أيها الذين كفروا لا تعتذروا اليوم إنما تجزون ما كنتم تعملون يا أيها الذين آمنوا توبوا إلى الله توبة نصوحا عسى ربكم من يكفر عنكم سيئاتكم ويدخلكم جنات ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار يوم لا يخزي الله النبي يوم لا يخزي الله النبي والذين آمنوا معه نورهم يسعى بين أيديهم وبأيمانهم 
يقولون ربنا أتمم لنا نورنا واغفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير يا أيها النبي جاهد الكفار والمنافقين واغنض عليهم ومأواهم جهنم وبئس المصير ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فخانتاهما فلم يغنيا عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل ادخلا النار مع الداخلين وضرب الله مثلا للذين امنوا امراه فرعون اذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنه ونجني من فرعون وعمله ونجني من القوم الظالمين ومريم ابنة عمران التي أحصنت فرجها فنفخنا فيه من روحنا فنفخنا فيه من روحنا وصدقت بكلمات ربها وكتبه وصدقت بكلمات ربها وكتبه وكانت من القانتين